Oh, let's see here. The meeting is being recorded. All right. I'll do share screen in just a second. Can they can they see uh, me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Right behind me is a is a stove, a kitchen stove. And this morning we discovered mouse tracks on the kitchen stove. And these are from the white-footed deer mouse, which is a wild mouse that lives outside of the house. But this time of year in the fall, they very commonly move into shelter to pass the winter in some place like inside a house or a cave or other kind of thing as active mice rather than becoming dormant. But if they, um, if they don't have a house or something like that to move into, they uh, burrow down under the snow and, 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 and uh, actually keep active during at least part of the winter underneath the snow looking for food. But we have now, they've just moved in, it's apparently just yesterday. Uh, we had the squirrel in here two days ago, and now we have the white-footed deer mouse uh, also in the kitchen. So we'll probably live trap him and, uh, and, and turn him out the back door, but they have a way of getting back in again. All right, now, here we go. Now, Winnie, Winnie keeps pointing out to me that I don't need to shout because you all have good ears. Um, I'm sure that's true. My problem is that I can't hear myself. And so I don't really know how loud I am being. Um, we have been speaking about many different traits of individual species, like in mimicry and the acacia ants, and about whole groups of species in a variety of ways. And what I wanna do now is for the next three or four lectures, including this one, go back to looking very directly at one species, at its traits and how it operates, how it deals with the world around it as a kind of a, I don't wanna call it a model animal, but certainly these are the kinds of things that all animals have to deal with in one way or another. So as I've said here, it's uh, how they solve their problems. Now, um, it's a rodent that we're talking about. And um, the formal name for rodents is rodentia, which you think of as rats and mice and beaver and porcupines and um, things like that with the big buck teeth in the front. Rabbits, incidentally, are not rodents. They are very different. Um, but they independently evolved the front teeth that kind of look like uh, rabbit, let me assume you kind of look like rat and mice front teeth. Um, anyway, that's the, the order for them, rodentia. But I took the moment to go into Google, which is kind of a fun thing you might try doing yourself sometime for something you know about, and looked up the origin of, tried to figure out the origin of this word rodentia. Um, it turns out that in, in, uh, in English, we say gnaw for how things chew into things. Uh, the German word is nagen, and the old English word is genagen. So you can see where the gn here and the gn there are related to each other. And the progression probably is for, for gnawing, for the word gnawing, which goes with rodents because Latin is rodere for gnawing. Uh, and um, uh, roer is Spanish for to gnaw. Uh, and so you can see how these words are related uh, to this. And um, I guess the last thing to mention here is that uh, um, the reason why uh, Latin word, the uh, Latin language is chosen to use for scientific names is, is that it doesn't change or not believed to think of when you think of it as a dead language that does not change, uh, which makes it easier to keep maintain these, these relationships. So here's our rodent. This is the name for it, uh, Lyomis salveni. We'll see it in just a moment. And it lives in this family, Heteromyidae, here. And um, today, the proper name for this animal 
is heteromies so many? Because taxonomists have decided that this genus, Lyomis here, the, and another Dan, genus. Dan, you haven't shared your screen yet. You're not sharing your screen. I'm not sharing my screen. Hold on a minute here. Let's see. Hmm. Let's see here. Sorry, I thought I had. Okay, there we go. Now are we sharing it? No, still not. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can. You are sharing it right now. We're we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Oops. Backwards here. Um. <coughs> this is a slide I was showing before, just talking about speaking to the fact that we're talking about a species and how it solves its personal problems. And the species is a rodent in the order Rodentia, and that re or relates to ro ro Roderi, which is the Latin word for gnawing. And I looked up gnawing to see where how this thing fits together. Uh, <coughs> and our word gnaw, which is what rodents do, they gnaw into things, um, comes from Ganagan, which is Old English, which comes from German, which is Nagan. Spanish is roer. So you can see that the Spanish word for annoying thing is derived from the Latin word, not from the German side of things over here. Um, so now here's our animal, Lyomi selveni. And um, it's in the family Heteromyidae. And um, this is the name that if you look up, up, up in, in Google, you'll look up Lyomi, Selveni, you find many, 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 many references. The animal's been studied quite a bit. Um, but very recently, its name was changed to Heteromys Selveni. Now, why is that? It's because somebody, this is the family that it occurs in, Heteromyidae. So somebody decided that the genus Lyomys and the genus Heteromys were not two separate genera, they were just one. So taxonomically, the taxonomists take and join the two, and the older name is the one that persists. So what you know is that heteromys is an older name that is Lyomys. So Lyomys then just disappears. But of course, it doesn't disappear from Google. It doesn't disappear from all that literature. It doesn't disappear from people's minds. So now we have this confusion out there. If you look up Heteromys selveni in Google, you will find many, many fewer references than if you look up Lyomys selveni because Google doesn't make the connection between Lyomys and Heteromys, okay? So that's the kind of taxonomic tangle beside, behind the mouse. Now, this is the mouse itself. Now, this is a completely wild animal. As you can see, it's sitting on, on one of these and it's, it's, for me, a very strong um, indicator of personal variation amongst individuals in the wild. We've trapped thousands of these individual animals with live traps to, turn, to mark them and turn them loose. We'll see that later on. Um, and this particular animal stood out as being extraordinarily calm. It's not a pet. This is a wild animal. But simply was not bothered by being picked up and handled. So you could hand this animal to another person who could hand it to another person who could hand it to another person. You could reach into his cage, pick him up, look at him, put him back again. And of course, that's that kind of genome-based behavior that the Wistar Institute across the street from the big dormitory on campus um, used that, that sort of genetic information used to breed the Wistar white rats that you would use today in the laboratory, which are very friendly animals and very easy to handle and very easily passed from person to person. And th that's obviously not a kind of trait that allows you to stay alive in nature. But this particular individual is one who did have that trait. And this, this really stood out because you could just take it and, and, um, and do anything you wanted to. It didn't bother her at all. Now, if you look at the mouse herself, you see several things that um, relate to, to what's going to evolutionarily happen to this mouse, or what did evolutionarily happen to this mouse. First, there's a long tail that you see here. 
And then you'll see a, a long hind foot planted very firmly right there. You don't see the front feet at all. They're just little tiny feet hooked up underneath her head right in here. And then all this bulk that you see right here is muscle. That's the muscle for driving these hind feet. So this mouse is an incredible jumper. So you see one of these guys in the dark at night with a flashlight and you put your hand down and you think you're gonna catch him with your hand and you put your hand down just three or four inches above his back and suddenly drop your hand fast, you don't even touch the mouse. Somehow it feels the air coming from your hair, hand underneath your hand, hits that back and it jumps out from underneath it like a kangaroo would spring. And you don't even touch, you don't even get to touch the mouse. They're incredibly good at escaping that way. Um, big button eyes that you see right here. And if you were looking at it from the side, you'd see that they bulge. They're like domes sticking out. That's a sign of a nocturnal animal. And so it can take in light from all directions and, uh, and, do, and be able to see something in the dark. Okay. Big ears, and the big ears are for hearing things like an owl approaching in the light or a cat approaching in the light or a snake approaching. Um, and, and, and so this guy is set up for escaping. And furthermore, this name, Lyomis here, mice means obviously mice, all right? M-Y-S is obviously derived related to the word mouse. Um, Lyo means smooth or slippery. And if you hold one of these and you try to hang on to them, it's just like grease because the hair is very, very, very slippery. It's not greased. Let me back up here. Whoops, sorry, wrong way again. Um, the hair is not greased. It's extremely slippery, which of course is another way of escaping from an animal, a predator who's going to grab you, okay? Now, out of that animal in tropical dry forest in Costa Rica evolved this guy. This is what you know as a kangaroo rat. This is from the southern, from the southwestern US and here's the same old big feet that you saw uh, before on the Lyomis. Here's the little tiny front feet that you see here. And here's this great big chunk of muscle right here, which is what drives the jump for this thing. And then there's the long tail. The long tail is for balance. When this, remember when we were talking about the dog that had lost uh, two legs in, in Africa? And I said that the tail was always in motion. Well, the point being is that that's part of the balance when you're moving and jumping and dodging in the air is this tail on the back end here. It goes one direction, your body goes the other direction. Well, the, the little Lyomis mice do the same thing, but this thing has evolved a bigger, fatter tail with a big tuft on the end of it, almost like a, 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 a propeller or a, um, a shovel. Big sensitive ears for hearing animals come in. And to give you an idea of how good these things are from escaping, they live in deserts where there are rattlesnakes. And rattlesnakes, of course, eat, uh, eat uh, dipodomies, kangaroo rats. Um, well, some people have done experiments and I was just looking at a experiment on, the, on Zoom, the, uh, on, the, on YouTube through, uh, through Google and um, they did experiment with a, with a, with a uh, rattlesnake and it struck 23 times at one of these mice and 22 times it missed. In other words, the mouse could sense the strike of the snake coming fast enough to use these big feet put on the ground and the big muscle behind to jump away from it. And um, the one time that it caught the mouse, only one fang just got in a little bit and not enough to um, not enough to kill the mouse with the venom, which of course also implies that the kangaroo rat here uh, probably has some um, uh, immunity to, uh, to rattlesnakes who live as the regular predators in their own world. Now here's one in the, this is the Lyomis in the wild. And what you're seeing here is a big fruit on the ground with a very hard rind on the outside. And um, you can see these two scars here in the tip. This was done by a big rodent who chewed a hole, tried to chew in there, 
and then actually shoot a hole in here. And so what this mouse is doing is trying to get the fruit and seeds which are inside of here that was opened up by the bigger rodent, right? Now, what was he going to do with them? It's a seed predator. This guy is a is a specifically a predator on seeds, on baby trees, if you like. Now, this is the kind of photograph that you see in National Geographic or in pretty posters or something where you see the animal as a portrait and is doing something, and that's the way. You would, if you if you were on the literature, that's what you, the way you see Lyomi's Salvini. But that is not really Lyomi's Salvini. This is Lyomi's Salvini. This animal is nocturnal. Everything it does is in the black dark. Well, there may be a little bit of moonlight, a little reflected starlight, but basically it's in the full blast dark. So what you now know is that his sense of hearing is extremely good. His sense of smell is very good. Is a very strong orientation ability in the black dark. And to give you some idea about that is, as you will see a live trap a little later on, uh, we live trap thousands of these things. And in the beginning, um, I did not grasp how much they understood of their world effectively as though they had their eyes shut. And um, so in the field, we would take them out of the live traps mark them or look at them and let them go. And what I discovered was I could throw one in the air, two meters in the air, he falls and lands on the litter. When he hits the litter, upon bouncing on the ground, he runs in a straight line down a hole and out of sight. So you think, well, okay, he knew where the hole was. So he, you know, that's entrance to his underground burrow. But you can't just say a mouse two days later. And you throw him in the air two days later, and he lands on the ground. But this time he goes in quite other direction in a straight line down the hole. You catch him again two days later and do the same thing, and you discover that he knows from the moment he hits the ground, confused, dropped on the ground from up above, from the moment he hits the ground, he already knows five or six different holes that he can run on a straight line to, like a billiard ball going across a pool table. And um, so he pointed us, he knows that world in the black dark. So he can do that same thing if an owl or a snake or a fox or a cat is chasing him. Okay. Now here's one that was hit by a car, it's roadkill. And let's take a look at the whole animal as a whole. It weighs about seven, this thing weighs about 70 grams. Let me get my pointer back here. Weighs about 70 grams and um, lying on his back, obviously. And uh, we'll, we'll focus in on the head in here in a, with a couple more slides later on about how this part of his body is modified to be a seed predator. But back at this end, what we know immediately is that this guy is in full reproductive state. Now, you know, you think of dogs and cats and people and cows and horses as reproducing all year round. But most animals do not reproduce all year round. They have a particular time. So this animal immediately looking at the photograph, you know that he, he is in his reproductive time because here is one testicle right here. Here is another testicle right there. They're inside his scrotum. When he was not reproductive, these two would have been pulled up into the body cavity where they're hot from his body. When he gets reproductive, they descend down into here where they're cooler. So that keeps the sperm alive. And then the sperm is stored in the epididymis, which is the sac that you see right here. So that's full of sperm, ready to impregnate a female. When he's not reproductive, the whole thing slides upwards and shrinks up into here. Okay, That's the back end. Here's the big legs, the big feet I was talking about. The big, the big drumstick for here with a lot of muscle on it and all this through here is muscle. And uh, then this much smaller thorax with a small feet here in the front. Let's take a look at the head. Now think about this for a moment. What are you looking at? You're looking at his incisors. You see the two right here and the two on the lower jaw right there. Think about that. Can you do that with your mouth? Can you close your lips behind your incisors so that your molars 
and the rest of your mouth are not exposed. No, you can't. This is a specialization that allows him to chew into things, sticky things, toxic things, juicy things, whatever they happen to be, without having them in his mouth. So he, they're, they're basically cutting tools where they can chew into something and then decide whether it's going to eat more of it or not. And that piece then he takes into his mouth. So this is something, this is a very special adaptation of rodents, which allows them to cut into all sorts of things, chew holes in your wall, chew holes into a container of food, uh, chew holes through wood and, and seed pods and the fruits and all kinds of things. Um, and so it's a very special trait, which is very different from the front end of other animals, which we'll look at uh, later on. Of course, here's his nose over here, but you see these whiskers, very, very long way way back to there and they when he's there and dead like this they're just back here in a sign of a relaxed state but when this guy is running around in the dark if these whiskers are sticking out in front like buffers and if they bump into something he doesn't hit it in other words they're his early warning as he moves through the dark and we had a pet much bigger rodent like this <laughs> who could run full blast through a house with chairs and tables and walls and all kinds of things in the black dark with his whiskers out in front and never hit anything. <coughs> now, the second thing to see here is the pouch. See this one right there? There's one right there. Here's the pouch turned inside out. So I just reached inside and pulled it all like, like pulling your pocket out and turning your pocket inside out. So what you can see is that over here, there's a big, a big space inside of here. Notice that it's hairy on the inside. That tells you that it's an evagination from the outside evolutionarily. In other words, you didn't make that by eating more, having more inside his cheeks because that wouldn't be any hair there. Okay? Just like you, you don't have hair on the inside of your cheek. So if you expand your cheeks, to carry things in them, they would be hairless. But what this thing has done evolutionarily is develop from a, a, a pocketing in from the outside, which has become then the pocket for carrying things. So what is it carrying? Here's another roadkill, different one. And here's the pouch. It's a full with a full pouch. Here's the pouch there and the pouch there. And you may ask, why are these guys getting hit by cars? Well, it, let's put it this way. What this mouse is doing in running through the dark or at night, crossing a road with his pouches full like this, is hanging two watermelons around your neck and asking you to run across the interstate when the car is going 60 miles an hour. In other words, that, that's the, the challenge that this mouse has, all right? So let's open up that pouch. So here's the pouch itself, and these are the seeds that are inside. You'll notice that the seeds are mostly clean. These are grass seeds. They're all clean. And then there's a few of them that he's left the outer coating on. Why would he peel off the outer coating before picking up the seeds? Because that gives you more space. In other words, this, you can get more seeds in there if you clean them off out there in the field where you found them. Okay. And here's what they look like as a whole. So this is what he did was go out there, go into a patch of grass, and pick up those seeds one at a time with his front feet and then peel them, clean them with those incisors in the front. This is the actual grass. These are the actual fruit pieces from the grass and here's the individual seeds that were inside of that. Now, we have, as I say, we have live trapped a very large number of them and I have stolen seeds from their pouches um, as an indicator of what species of seeds they will in fact eat. Because you remember, this is just like toxic butterflies and, and toxic seeds for other animals. These guys also have things that they can't eat or won't eat. Uh, and then there's things that they will. So this just gives you an idea of the variety of species that can be taken from one, one set of mice in one place in one night. In this case, the 30th of June. And um, so these are seeds, just the variety is probably about uh, 12 or 15 species of seeds in that, in that Petri dish. They also eat insect pupae, as well as larvae, which are just ready to pupate, which is what this is right here. This is a, called prepupa, 
And um, this is a very alive my, mouse here. This is not a road kill. Uh, I just pushed this, this out so that you can see it. But uh, the point being that from a mouse's standpoint, the seed is uh, high quality food, but it also has nasty chemicals in it. So the only set of seeds that he can deal with are the ones that are, don't have very many. It's like e you eating almonds or uh, filberts or uh, cashews, okay? But insect pupae are by and large not chemically defended. So they're in effect a seed, protein, fat, water, carbohydrates that don't have any defenses other than being hard to find. So what he's doing is foraging in the litter and there's times a year when there's a lot of insect pupae, that's what he eats. When there's a lot of seeds, that's what he eats. Now, what's he do with all of this? This is a, a cutaway diagram of an underground tunnel for a Lyomi. So this would be the entrance hole right through here or another entrance hole here. And inside are tunnels like this, which are actually cleaned out old root channels from, from trees. And uh, then there'll be a nest somewhere. And he will also have storage, have storage chambers as well. So here me, is me digging down through the dirt and finding one of his storage chambers. So here's where he's gone and picked up seeds, brought them in, in his pouches, and stored them underground. Okay, so that's that's food. This is his nest. Sort of remind you of a undergraduate's apartment scattered with uh, pizza boxes and uh, takeout food containers and things like that. These are um, fragments of all kinds of, of plant parts, some of which I think were probably brought in to be cushions as in a mattress. And then there's seeds. You see, here's the individual seeds, individual seeds. So well, this is what we found when we dig down and you find the nest. And we didn't think much more about it, but for whatever reason, I was cleaning these out, spreading them out, and I suddenly realized that in these seeds, there were seed coats. This is the coat right here of an intact seed. But also, so here are the seed coats right here. Also were seeds that looked like this. And my first thought in looking at that was, oh, well, these are seeds that the mouse chewed into and then rejected. You know, who cares? But then I discovered that a very large number of the seeds had these notches cut in them. Aha. Uh -huh. So we went and looked carefully. What they're doing, what the mouse is doing, is making bean sprouts. Takes the hard seed, chews a notch in it, another notch in it, a notch in it, water enters through here, the seed germinates, ends up like this, and now this is a germinating seedling, and that is what the mouse eats because that has taken its toxic chemicals, its lectins, uh, proteins that are the same proteins that you uh, detoxify by boiling black beans, taking those proteins and begin to chop them up and use them as construction for the seedling, which means detoxifies the seed. So now the mouse can go ahead and eat those things just like you eat um, boiled beans or as you eat uh, germinated um, uh, bean, bean sprouts. So to look at that, we asked two questions. So here, there, this, is, this is the body weights for two, three, four, five mice, okay, over a month. And this is giving them, the only food they were getting was these germinated wet seeds over here. And what you can see is that that diet maintains the body weight perfectly. Now that didn't mean that they were necessarily uh, super happy with very monotonous food. I have no opinion about that. But what the point is, it showed very clearly that on a, on a germinating seed diet, they could just do fine, or what appears to be fine in the laboratory sense. Now this is asking the question, what happens if you have no food at all? You're a Lyomis, you're in a cage, you have water, but you don't have any food. That's the red line you see right here. This is the body weight for three mice. Those three mice, basically, if we hadn't rescued them at this point, would have died of starvation. This is three days worth. So the mouse can last three days on no food at all. This is the dark lines you see here are the body weights of mice 
on non-germinated seeds. Okay, so they weren't allowed to, they, but they ate them. And what did the body weights do? On non-germinated seeds, the body weights fell, just like it had no food at all. But at this point here, the body weight leveled off. So it never got back up to here, but it goes out and sits like this. And it goes down here and it wanders around and sort of, they don't die of starvation. What they do is gradually their gut system adjusts to this new diet. And it's the gut system and microbes in the gut coupled with the ability of the liver to degrade the nasty things that are in the dried seeds, the non-germinated seeds. So this is just so one way of very crudely in the field getting at the question of why are they notching seeds? So what we discovered was that they notched all kinds of seeds. So here are three different species put in the same thing. They all notch all of these. And then the question was, well, are they, um, do they learn to do this? So we took pregnant females and isolated them with their kids with a diet, uh, two kinds of diets. One diet was one that had uh, just regular seeds that they like to eat all the time. Uh, and another with seeds that, um, uh, that needed notching and soaking to germinate uh, in order to get them going. And what we discovered was that the juveniles, the kids knew to dodge the seeds all the time without the presence of mom. And the even notched buttons, plastic buttons, and they tried to notch nickels as in the coin nickel. In other words, they a small hard object, they understood to notch that and then leave it on moist ground which is of course in the nest, the dirt that the nest is in is moist ground. So now we move out of the lab and uh, well, the lab is our house, but the point is move out of the forest and uh, try offering them things in the forest and see what happens. Now this is a cage put over this offering of, of seeds such that the mice can go through this mesh, but the bigger animals like peccaries and goonies can't get through that mesh to the plate, okay? So here's what the plate looks like. So these are different species of seeds put down on the plate uh, and then you walk away and leave it overnight and you come back the next morning. And the next morning, it looks like this. Here's five seeds right there. And one, two, three, four. And there's a fifth green one underneath the edge here. So let's go back again. See, here's the five green ones right here. And here are the five big dark flat ones right over here. So what you can see is they took everybody except this and this, i.e. on the site, they, oh, I should say, these mice in this forest had never seen these seeds before. These are all novel seeds to these mice in this forest. So they decided on the spot that those seeds were rejects, too toxic. And incidentally, they starved to death if that's all you gave them for seeds. Um, so you think, well, that's a nice clean experiment. So you go out and do the same thing the same night. So you go out and you set up another one, just like this, same place. You come back and it looks just like this. Aha, so now we kind of understand the other seeds are good. And then that's how you do it four nights in a row and what happens? You come back, whoops, you come back and the plate looks very similar to this. The only thing that's gone are this set right here and this set right here. And the other one we see yeah. These, this, 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 and this are gone. No, the rest are still here. But what's changed by the time you've done this four times? What's changed is that we didn't realize in the beginning is the first night you did this, the, the mouse who lives nearby discovers the plate, goes over to the plate checks everybody out and he says, I reject this and I reject that. So I take everybody else to my burrow and I try them out in the safety of my burrow. And I discovered that the only ones I really like are this one and that one and this one here. 
So that mouse now is trained, but there's other mice who live nearby this plate. So those other mice come and they try the new ones that haven't seen the plate before, for them it's all new. So they start out, they take everybody home except for this piece and this piece in here. And it takes about four nights to get all the mice around this thing acclimated to where they all know what's good and what's bad. And from then on, the only things that are gone are this one, this one, and this one. So it, it shows you how complicated a field experiment can become that starts out looking very, very simple, like put the plate out like this, see what happens, and you get a result. But it's, a, it's an artifact here, which is that the seeds you thought were edible and taken away were not. They were taken to their burrow to try out. And of course, the mouse didn't bring them back to the plate and leave them on the plate. Now, the forest has a number, a lot of species of trees in it. And this particular tree is a big wind dispersed uh, fruit. You can see this is a, a 15 centimeter long ruler up here for scale. So this is a big fruit. And inside the fruit are seeds like this. And what strikes you about this is these wind dispersed seeds are scattered all over the forest. The ground is just paved with them in some years. Nobody touches them. They're just not picked up. The mice just ignore them. Nobody else eats them either. They just sit there. Well, we in the early days trying to figure out what's going on. These are the seeds right here. Give a dish, a petri dish of those seeds. Here's the individual seeds. Petri dish of those individual seeds to a mouse, but no other food. And this is a little gruesome. This is us learning. This is a mouse who died of starvation. You can see, see the back is bent like this. That's the first, you see a carcass that looks like that with the back bent like that, almost without doubt that animal died of starvation. What we learned very quickly was that if you keep very close track of the mice, by day three, the hair begins to stand up on the back of the head. And if you don't feed that mouse within 24 hours, he's dead. So what we learned to do these experiments without killing the mice, but in the beginning, yes, we did kill some. And the point is, if you look at this plate, every seed in it was peeled. See, there's this peeled seed, peeled seed, peeled seed, peeled seed. These are all peeled seeds. These are the shells from the outside. These are intact seeds over here that I put in for scale. This mouse tried every single seed to find if he could find something edible in there. No way. He starved to death without an empty stomach. Okay. So now the question becomes, well, what is protecting this seed? So when you slice through with a knife, immediately the first thing you see is there's little pockets inside, which have little have liquid inside of them. So what you do now as a field scientist, you ask yourself, where in the world, the whole world, is there somebody who specializes on toxic legume seeds? These are beans, all right? On legume, toxic legume seeds. And you discover there's a lady in, in, um, in the UK, in England, who does. And so we write her and we say, if we give you a kilo of these seeds, will you look in them and see what kind of nasty chemicals could be inside? And um, she writes back and says, yes. So we send her, I don't know, a half a kilo or a kilo, some bulk quantity of these, um, of these seeds. And she looks through them very hard and she says, none of the things I specialize on. Now, there's something we didn't understand about organic chemists. They are specialists, just like biologists are specialists on birds or snakes or fish or insects. Well, the chemists are specialists on their particular kinds of chemistry as well. And so she says, no, none of the chemicals that I work with, and, I, and she was working mostly with things that have nitrogen in them, amino acids, alkaloids, things like that. No, but I, I think I'm detecting that they're full of a nasty compound called flavonoids, but I don't do that, but there's a guy in Scotland who does that. So we write him and say, well, would you look at them? So he does. So he takes these seeds and he discovers all excited as a chemist because he says, wow, I found eight different species of flavonoids that are undescribed in these seeds. Fantastic. So he writes papers as a chemist would write, but he didn't care about mice, about it as a chemist would write them. So I said to him after he'd done all these lab work with these kilos of seeds, um, can you get us pure compounds of those eight uh, flavonoids? Oh, yes. So this was, now, we're, we're talking here now about in the 60s and 70s. Um, and um, actually, early in the early 80s, and uh, 
he uh, says, yes, I can. So in those days, of course, nobody worried about drug deals. And uh, so we got in the mail eight vials full of white crystalline material, which of course looked terrible in today's eyes. And um, so we went across the street to the vet school here and, uh, and borrowed some uh, very friendly white rats and um, uh, very happy, <laughs> very happy, fun right, white rats to work with. And we took the regular lab chow that they, they, that they feed the, the lab rats and uh, ground it up very finely and added then each of these different eight alkaloids to the lab chow and make little artificial seeds out of them. And we give the artificial seeds to the white rats and the white rats just gobble them up. They think it's just wonderful. They get fat and happy and they love to eat and all this kind of stuff for all these eight different flavonoids. And so I say to myself, oh God, there's no, there's no, uh, no toxicity there. It's got to be some other chemicals, right? Um, then I'm sitting there looking at my desktop with these eight vials, each one of which still had a small fraction of the chemical left in it. And I said to myself, wait a minute, the mouse doesn't eat one flavonoid. It has to bite into eight of them in the same seed. So I took the eight compounds, the remaining bits of eight compounds, mixed them all together, which a chemist would never do, a pharmacologist would never want. Mixed them all together, put them in a lab chow, made up little seeds and gave them to the lab rats and absolutely would not touch them. In other words, it was the mixture that was turning off the predator. It wasn't a single compound. This is something that has escaped the people who do analyses of nasty chemicals in wild plants, wild seeds, wild sources over and over again because they don't want to work with mixtures. They want to work with pure compounds. So they work like crazy to separate the compounds. Now, in the same habitat with this mouse, there's this big tree, Enterlobium cyclocarpum. And um, this is a favorite food of the, of, of the mouse. The seeds are a favorite food of the seeds. And um, just again, looking at the origin of a word like uh, cyclocarpum, for example, the common name for this thing is Guanacaste. It's the name, the national tree. And it's the name for the province that we work in. It's the name for the conservation area where I am. But where does the word Guanacaste come from? turns out to be a Nahuatl Indian name from Mexico, which means ear, that means fruit, gua is fruit, and nacaste is ear, as in E-A-R. Where does that come, the ear fruit come from? Well, here's the tree itself. And all these dark dots in the tops of the tree are fruits. And here's for scale, there's a, a, a land rover over here on the left-hand side. On the ground are the fruits. And what they are is they're big, flat, curved things that look kind of like an ear. So these are ear fruits, to use the Nahuatl, the indigenous Nahuatl name from Mexico um, for, for, the, for the tree. They fall on the ground, presented to a ground-based dispersal agent. So we slice open one of them, and they're dry, full of protein and sugars. And here's the seeds inside. So there they are, to be swallowed by a big mammal. The megafauna that you guys have seen and talked about, or we've talked about already. Um, Pleistocene horses, for example, um, gomphotheres, all those big mammals would have eaten these things. However, what do you see here? Here what you see is where the mouse has come along and chewed open the fruit and taken the individual seeds out. So here's one where it chewed open the seed and, seed and I put seeds back in so you can see the location of the seeds here. But the point being is if the fruits fall on the ground and a big mammal has not come along and gobbled them up pretty soon, the mice go out there and gather them in large numbers. And these are the ones that are notched in the mouse's nest, put, stored in the underground and then notched when they want to eat them and put on moist soil so they germinate and you've got bean sprouts to eat. The mouse can carry six seeds in the pouches, three on one side and three on the other side. This is another roadkill. 
And um, uh, incidentally, this is the time of year when it's not reproductive. You can see that the down here, this portion here, there's no, no the testes are almost, the scrotum is almost not descended and there's no uh, epididymis here at the tip. Um, but you can put three seeds in here and three seeds in that pouch right there. So what its job is doing is going out tonight, finding an interlobium seed crop, frantically chewing open and getting six seeds, putting in the pouches, running back to the tunnel, going back to the tunnel down the hole and caching the seeds and go back and do it again. Now, every time it does that, it's exposing itself to snakes, owls, cats, foxes, the whole package of predators. And so the more time it spends doing that, the more risky it is. So of course, what it wants to do is maximize the number of seeds it can get back in the shortest period of time, and then live underground on this stored food, rather than go out looking for food every single night. We'll get back to predators a little more later on. Now, if the big mammal has come along and eaten those fruits, then its dung looks like this. There's this interlobium seed there, another one there, another one there, another one there. Here's one here, there's one there, some more over here. So there might be 10 or 15 seeds or 20 seeds in this piece of, of in this particular case, diuretic horse dung on the, on the road. Okay. So my thought was, well, this was before I understood the full relationship between the mice and the, and the, um, uh, and we decided we wanted to grow a bunch of these trees. So what we did was the horses eat the fruits. So what we did was make artificial horse dung. So here's fresh horse dung here with seeds put in it like this and then filled over on the top. So now we have about a kilo of horseshit with sitting inside of it, 15, 20, 100 seeds, whatever number counted. And then we go out and plunk that down as though a horse had passed by and here's the artificial horse dung. So this was the naive beginning of an experiment to, um, uh, to again to grow interlobium seedlings. Well, you come back three or four days later, and this is what you see. So the, the, the pile of, of horse dung is now spread out on the ground, and but there it is, but you don't see any little seedlings starting up from this. Hmm. Well, okay, so you come back a week later, and you look at it again, and still there aren't any. And then you get down on your hands and knees and really look closely and you discover that in the horse dung are the shells of interlobium seeds. In other words, the mouse found them in the dung and ate them on the spot. In other words, peeled out the interior of the seed and ate it there and just dropped the shells. Hmm. And now we understand what's going on. The mouse comes out of his hole at night to go foraging for seeds. He puts his nose in the air and goes sniff, sniff. If he smells dung from any animal, he just runs in a straight line to that dung because that dung is likely to have seeds in it. So suddenly now seed predation becomes both looking for seeds and fruits that are just underneath the parent tree, but also going to animal dung to get seeds. So just because a horse has eaten that fruit and defecated the seed somewhere, doesn't mean the seed is safe. So now we begin to ask questions about, well, does it matter where the horse defecated? Does it matter how big an animal it was? This is a mimic of elephant dung. Now elephant dung comes in eight kilo packages. So if you want to, that's about 15 pounds, something like that. So this is like a big bucket full of horse dung with 100 or 500 seeds, interlobium seeds, mixed into it and dumped in the forest and dumped in open grasslands. This particular photograph is open grasslands. And here, what you see is, you see there's this big chunk in the center, which would sort of be the core of that dung. And then the same piece is distributed around the outside here. So somebody has gone in there and dug at this, so dug at it looking for things but they didn't get anything. I mean, they didn't get anywhere near all the things. And so here is a seedling of a Guanacaste tree. Here is a germinating seed right there, another germinating seed right there, a single seed right here. And so the, now we get the question of, well, how many seeds got, get gotten? So if the elephant ate 100, 500, 1,000 seeds, 
how many, and then they came out in the dung, how many would survive? So here's one in the forest. Now in the forest, these are a different seed that we put in the same dung. These are palm nuts and they're too big for the mice. So the mice just don't do anything with them. But I can tell you right now that basically this is the, what the dung looks like. This was the beginning, the center of it right here. And it's spread out by the mice looking for seeds. They found, well, here's how much they found. First, oh, first they scooped the whole thing up and washed through it. So this is an undergraduate from Penn uh, volunteering to uh, help with this whole study. And uh, we put them on a screen and then you wash all the dung off of it. And then you count how many seeds you get. So in the forest, the forest of eight kilos of, of elephant dung with, um, with 500 seeds in it ends up with that many seeds surviving. In other words, that it was an elephant didn't save much at all. And defecated in the forest, that's lethal. In the grassland, here's what you get. This is out of one, this is the, the remaining seeds and, this, and the germinating seeds from one elephant dung in the grassland. These are only 10 meters apart. In other words, fine scale details because the mouse refuses to go out in the grass because in, in the grass, he feels exposed. In the forest, he feels safe. So he, he will run out there and dig a little bit and run back in the forest. So he doesn't get much of anything. So here you get this result over here. And here's what, uh, uh, what, it, uh, what the final numbers actually look like. In the grassland out of a bunch of different ones, 77% um, of the seeds survived. In the forest, only 2% survived. So now you can see where evolution favors fruit characteristics that will dump the seeds in the right place. And part of being the right place is where the predators will find you or will not find you. In other words, that this, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to, to get across here is that the world is not homogenous. The world is not made up of sort of uniform decisions. It makes a huge difference where you are how much dung there was in there, what kind of seed you are, as to whether the mice get you or whether the dispersal agents put you in the right spot. So let's ask this question in a little more detail. This is cow shit, right? If you ever work with cows, you know that when it's fresh, you put your hands into that and your hands smell like cow dung for two days later, even no matter how much you wash them, right? It's very, very finely masticated, very finely worked over by microbes and um, very sticky. And then it dries down into like a really hard, solid structure like you see here. This is horse dung. Comes in, in, in balls like this and you can take that ball in your hand and, and it's friable and break it open. It comes out in a lot of little tiny pieces. So now you put these down side by side in the forest. So the mouse then has a choice, which will I look for seeds in? And over and over and over again, it prefers horse dung. In other words, the mouse is evaluated. I will find stuff in this easily. And they get almost all the seeds in the horse dung. Whereas the ones in the heart and the, in the uh, cattle dung, they will work very hard to get at them, but they have a terrible time finding them and they don't get most of the seeds. So again, it's in which species ate the fruits then determines how effective the mice are at getting the seeds that they need for their food. So let's examine this just a little further. Um, this is putting things out in horse dung, which we know the mice are quite willing to search in, and then just naked on plates, no dung at all. And the plates in the, oh, no, no, in the same place, they're just a couple meters apart in the forest. So you know it's the same mice that are visiting these different offerings. So this is for a bunch of knights down here on this axis down here. And this is the percent of the seeds that get taken. Now the Guanacaste tree seeds, when you put them down in the horse dung, almost 100% get taken every night. And off the plates, everybody gets taken. So all you're seeing in the variation you see here is only a matter of accidents of you didn't quite get all of them in the, seed, in the dung because it's a little hard to find them. But aside from that, it's exposed on a plate, the mice basically take everybody. 
Then we take wild lima beans. Now you haven't met wild lima beans before, but let me tell you how toxic they are. If you took a teaspoonful, no, three teaspoonfuls of wild lima beans will kill you. They're full of cyanide. Indian grandmothers, God knows how long ago, selected for lima beans that don't have cyanide. So that's why you can buy them in the supermarket. Okay. So we take the wild ones and we give them the mice in, on the, in a, mixed with the granicosti seeds and on plates. And it's very interesting. This is, you can see how this, the wild lima beans are taken first a lot. These are the ones that, this is where the mice are exp, uh, um, exposing themselves to the seeds. They're, they're trying them out for the first time. So they take quite a few, but it drops down quickly to a set it goes like this. And when, when it's flat like this over time, what that's basically saying is that there's some mice who are in fact resistant to cyanide. Your liver can do that for you. Then there's some that can't. So part of the mice, part of the seeds are gone, part of them are not gone. But when you, and, and in the dung, it makes it harder for them to find them. They're small. When you put them out on a plate, the acceptance goes way up. Meaning that most of the problem here was in fact not the toxicity, but rather finding the little seeds. These are the black beans that you buy in the supermarket. You can see what happens here. By the end of the end of this experiment, down to day ten, um, the mice have basically decided that uh, this is not for me, especially if I have to look for it in in, in dung. Yeah, and out here on an open plate, same thing. But why does it go up and down like this? What we discovered was the morning dew on the open exposed plate soaks the black bean and it starts to germinate. So in a morning that you had heavy black, heavy uh, dew fall, you get high taking of the black beans. And on the mornings that are dry and warm, you get a very low taking of the black bean. Meaning that the detailed conditions day by day can influence whether the seed gets taken or not taken. The, finally, the one called Chaperno here at the bottom is that Loncocarpus seed with all the flavonoids in it, not taken at all. So what you can figure out, the ones that are taken are just by inexperienced mice, they're just growing. <coughs> they're basically, they're just rejected all the time from dung or on a plate. These are the seeds we were looking at just on the plates and so here's the wild lima beans. As you can see, they're kind of small. Uh, obviously, um, indigenous people selected for not only non-toxic, but also bigger ones. This is more of a size of a, of a commercial line of it here. There's our longer cover seeds. And these are buttons bought on South Street to mix in with these to see what the response was to something which is obviously not a seed. And the thing about these is these are taken the first night and then ignored. And as the mice learn very quickly that a plastic button is not anything worth uh, paying any attention to. So now let's move away from the individual choices and down to the population of mice. This is an aerial photograph looking down on the study plots. This is one of them right here, and this is the other one here. Um, and um, in this forest, this, this area right here, is, think of that as about, uh, about two football fields, two American football fields side by side is the area that you're looking at right there. Uh, they have two different names. One is primary forest and the other is secondary successional forest. Here's the secondary successional forest in the dry season. So you say, well, okay, that's the dry season. There's not much shade, a lot of dry ground, a lot of dry dead leaves. And this is where the mice are living is in there. But you, everybody forgets there's a second season at the same time. Every time the sun sets, you have this season over here, black dark. So they're two totally different worlds. This is the rainy season, same photograph, exact same photograph. This tree that's just sitting right here on the right hand side is that tree right there. This leaning tree right here is that leaning tree right there. So for six months, the world looks like this. For six months, the world looks like this. But every night it looks like this. 
So it's three different worlds. What the mouse does is basically stay in its tunnel underground all during the day in the dry season and the rainy season. So its world really converts to this world over here. But now how it sees the rainy season and the dry season at night, I can't even begin to interpret. In other words, how does this view? Obviously from the owl standpoint, looking for trying to catch a mouse on the forest floor. These are two very different worlds. Same with a cat, same with a snake, the whole packet. So the predator world that we think of as being there, yeah, it's there, but from the mouse's standpoint, it may not be at all what we think it is, but let's keep on that point. Here's a, one of the live traps called a Sherman live trap. It's a little aluminum box, folds up, put it in your back pocket. Um, that's about a foot long from there to there. And um, you just put them down on the ground like this and the mice come out at night and one of them goes inside the trap. There's the trap right there with the mouse sitting in front of it. Now, what we bait the trap with is germinating guanacaste seeds. In other words, these mice really like those seeds. And in fact, if it's carrying other seeds in its pouch here, it will often dump the other seeds here in front of the trap in order to get the seeds that are in the trap to take home. In other words, it's, it's T-bone steaks and chocolate sundaes. That's how they... So what we want is the mice to become what we call trap heavy, meaning that as soon as they encounter a trap, they get caught. We're not, we want to get every mouse in the place, not, not just uh, some, some um, statistically significant sample. We want to get all of them, which we eventually do, but it takes seven nights in, in place to do it. Um, so anyway, this is a trap. Now these traps, this little aluminum fold up trap here is made in one person's garage in Tallahassee, Florida of the Sherman family called Sherman Live Traps. If you could dissolve the whole world, except for Sherman Live Traps, you'd still see the globe. These traps are everywhere. And they make them in different sizes for different size animals. So that there have been this is a, a three generation family. So I mean, we're talking about an enormous numbers of these traps made by people who study mammals of one sort or another, one size or another, uh, as a way of, of catching, of catching uh, live animals and then dealing with them. This is a trapping crew at that particular time. So each one of these traps has got a mouse in it. So what they did was run out and run through 523 traps in the morning and bring all the ones back that have a mouse. So every trap is marked, so we know where it goes back in the forest. So they bring it back to the house. We go and weigh them, mark them, sex them, put them in their condition, all that stuff, and go back in the trap, then these guys take them back out and turn them loose at the same spot. And the first thing we learned right away is when you turn a mouse loose in the daytime and you're waiting for them to run, go down that hole, you have to stay right there. Because if you don't stay right there, out of nowhere will come a predator and snatch that mouse in the daytime. Now you, you yourself are protecting the mouse long enough to get down his hole. So that way we don't lose them to predators. But if you just dump the mouse and walk away, there's a high chance that a predator, a bird or a, a lizard or a snake will get, that, uh, will get that mouse. So how do you mark them? Well, first off, here's a very live mouse. He's uh, very happy to chew into my fingers. And uh, um, he's uh, but a nice healthy male. Here's a descended testes there. And uh, he weighs about uh, 60 grams, something like that. And um, he's uh, uh, being held that way in order to mark him. Okay. Now, traditionally, what mouse trappers do, mouse studiers, mouse demography studiers do, is cut off toes as a way of marking mice. Now think about that for a moment. This guy runs to escape from predators. He uses his hands for all kinds of food delivery and food finding, and you're gonna cut off his toes? So I was very frustrated. We tried uh, salmon fingerling tags that you put on little fish and, and stuck them on their ears. And the trouble is when the mouse goes down that tunnel, the tunnel is tight and it rips the, um, the tag off the ear. 
um, we uh, tried a, a variety of other methods. I can't remember what it was. And then we visited the, um, uh, what the hell's the name of that zoo? Lincoln Park. The Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. And um, uh, they have a taper. It looks like a big overweight horse, which I've forgotten whether you've seen one or not. Did you see one? I can't remember. Rufus. Rufus. Yeah, you're Rufus. And um, uh, I was standing there admiring their taper, and uh, somehow this question of uh, people stealing animals from uh, zoos came up. And I said, well, how do you know that that's that taper is your taper if it gets stolen? How, how, do, you, how do you know who it is? And the zookeeper reaches over and turns the lower lip of the taper inside out. And on the inside lip was tattooed a serial number. So the taper had been tattooed with a number inside of his mouth. And I said, where did you get the tattoo thing? He says, oh, there's a company in Massachusetts that sells tattoos like for people. So I wrote them and I had to convince them that I wasn't. <laughs> going to make it doing tattooing of people, but they sold me a, a tattoo machine, um, which we could then use to mark the mice. So here's one. This is a very alive mouse being held, uh, like held apart. And the, the tattoo needle is going to come out of this barrel right here uh, when you apply it to the actual skin of the mouse right here. And uh, it's going to leave these uh, holes. So this is, a, this is the number two mark here, and this is the number three mark. It's this pair right here. So this is one, two, three, and the top side of the ear is four, and the bottom side of the ear is five, and um, on both sides. So with that combination, we've done more than, uh, I don't know, more than 8,000 mice individually marked, um, by, and that lasts the whole life. So well, the goal here is you catch them when they're first out, three months old, four months old, something like that. And you mark them, and they're still marked like this a year later, two later, it's three years later, if they survive that long, of course, in the world of predators. Okay, so that's that's how we how we keep track of who is who. Now, once you know who your mice are in the plot, remember those big white squares I showed you in the forest. It's possible to mark that what's called the home range of each mouse. So this is the home range of one mouse. That's 10 meters from, let's see, from there to there is 10 meters. I'll give you some idea of scale. So from there to there is 10 meters, from there to there is 10 meters, and so on. So this is one mouse. This is where he's been caught many times, all right? This one mouse has been caught many times there. This one mouse has been caught many times just there. So you think, aha, now I know the home range for each mouse. Because you've caught them over and over and over again. So I think this is what classical mouse trappers do all the time. So we figure out what the home range, we know how many mice there are in the plot, everything is all fine and good. Hmm. I was looking at this thing and dawned on me suddenly that wait a minute, the mouse lives, let's just say, right there. That's his home entrance. He comes out at night, puts his nose in the air and sniffs. He sniffs your germinating seeds in a trap. He goes in a straight line to your trap. And gets caught. So that's where you think he lives. The next night he does the same thing. And he goes to this trap here, to that trap there, to that trap there, to that trap there. And pretty soon, that's his home range. But what about all this other space? You put seeds down out here, it disappears overnight. Who's eating them? So finally, the penny dropped. So what I did was close all the traps. There's 500, 529 traps. Close all the traps and leave open a set of traps just in this little octagon right here. And this one, and this one, and this one. For one night. And that one night, we caught in this little square right here, that mouse and that mouse and that mouse, and that mouse, and that mouse, and that mouse, and this mouse, and that mouse. In other words, if they're not trapped, they come out of their holes, and they go all over the place looking for food. And then they go back. So they know a world that's much bigger than the mouse trapper, the mammologist thinks they know. 
And the artifact of being able to do this is something that you can do. Now, the other way, of course, is put little radio collars on them and do a huge amount of work trying to keep track of each individual mouse with this little radio. But um, in this case here, we can do it with traps and work out that. They forage over a very bigger area. And in fact, all those, every square meter of this plot is uh, foraged over by a mouse. So now, what's the implications for this? Here we are in the dry season, May, rains haven't come yet, full moon, so there's some light in the forest, which of course mice don't like light. Right? That means exposes them to predators. And you trap all night, third of May, 529 baited traps. And every one of these dots is a mouse that gets caught. I think if I recall correctly, the dark ones are males and the light ones are females. Now, if, you, if you've just arrived in this forest and you put your traps out and this is what you catch, you say to yourself, oh, okay, well, this is the number of mice that are in this forest. That many males and that many females. We now wait two weeks and there's nobody born and this is not the, the birthing time. There's no, no new kids here. You wait two weeks. The rains have started because you waited two weeks. It's now dark in the moon instead of full moon. Same plot. Same traps look like that. In other words, the difference between this and this is fear. This is where you forage only when you have to. This is here you're leaving on your seeds that you have stored. This is foraging when you feel the safest to go looking for food and mates and doing whatever else you do in your life. Okay. And so you, this is, it's, a, it's a real dramatic measure, and it's all derived from being able to do this kind of thing, so we know who, who is where. So we could go down and put those little squares down on every single one of these things. Okay. So now a question comes up. I only have five minutes left, but here I have the question comes up. Can you use the mouse population as a monitor of things that are happening to that forest, climate change, perturbation from uh, industrial activity, whatever it happens to be. Well, this is from 1983 up to 1996. And this is the population density in those two plots in that forest. This is 500 mice at top density. This is almost zero. And that's about four years across from there to there, four or five years. And there's another one here, four to five years. Now, how could you use a ruler, a measuring device to monitor impact of anything on this forest with a ruler that does that to you? It goes all over the place. A high year, a low year, you wouldn't have any idea how that was related to the climate change or to whatever other wood perturbation that there was. Furthermore, when we hit 1996, the density stayed right here. Never went up again, but it never goes to zero. So the mice can hang in there at a very low density. But for some reason, we do not understand. Never went up again. Now, if we could have kept going for another 25 years or 55 years, maybe it would have gone up again. The only thing we can relate to so far is that we know that about in here, the insect density in this forest crashed. That means that the pupae in the litter crashes. And the pupae and the litter in the rainy season are the primary food of the mice. The seeds in the dry season are the primary food of the mice because the seeds are what the tree produces in the dry season. The rainy season trees don't make seeds for the most part, but there's a lot of insect pupae. So this could be the result of basically losing, this could be basically the, the result of, of losing that source of food during the rainy season, which would then mean that the only mice who make it are the few real smart individuals and the few really lucky individuals, the few who just happen to be in just the right spot. For predators, I keep talking about, here's one example. This is a viper that, uh, this is our front doorstep and uh, he caught this mouse right there and he's in the process of swallowing, swallowing the mouse. This is one for scale with somebody's fingers so you can see what they look like. Obviously, this is a slide I use in, in uh, conferences. 
Um, this is one of the predators, the owls. This is an owl pellet. Owls don't shoot the seeds, I mean, shoot the bones and hair through the owl. They take, extract the nutrients and then regurgitate the contents of their stomachs out. And here's a Lyomi skull right there. And this is all Lyomi's bones and fur. There's a snake who's just gone down the burrow and caught this mouse in the burrow and has just come out of the burrow. And the mouse has just died, just stopped wiggling a few seconds ago from the venom from the, from the snake. I have a scar in my hand from this same species of snake. Um, this is our living room. And this is a boa constrictor who could come through the mesh of the mouse's cage because the boa was quite thin. But this 60 gram boa ate a 65 gram experimental mouse who was feeding off this petri fish up here in the corner. And because he's got this mouse inside of him, now he can't get out. So this is why we know who it was that stole my mouse. Okay. But the point being is this is the world that mouse has to survive in. And these are the cats that we're talking about. This is an ocelot and uh, they're right there every night eating mice. Thank you very much. So we'll stop right there. Thank you to set our time as well. Okay. Um, now let's see here. What happens if I do this? There we go. Now, how do I get us back? Were there any um, chats that I should try to answer? No. Okay. No. No. Okay. Fine. All right, folks. That's all there is today. Oh, there we are.